go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What do you need to know right now? A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Here's a question. Is Mexico still Catholic? Is it still a Catholic country? Did you know there were more priests murdered in Mexico in recent years than in Nigeria? Let that sink in for a moment. We're going to have a conversation around that religious persecution going on just south of our border, not far from where I live right now, but with uh, David Ramos, ACI Princess, going to be on at 30 past the hour to talk about religious persecution in Mexico. Kelsey Wicks is back on the program. She's the executive director over at the ACI Group, also with the uh, EWTN, CNA. Well, she was on last week when Mike Koeniger was filling in and had a great conversation about Sister Wilhelmina. So we've decided to have a follow-up conversation with Kelsey Wicks. She joins us at 15 past the hour. How will this affect the community of the sisters there living in Gower, Missouri? We're going to find out. Kelsey's going to be on. Join us if you can. Lots of stories to cover today. We'll be linking to everything in our show notes over at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. I'm also going to be sending out some goodies in the email today. I didn't send it last week because I was on the road, but today I'm going to be sending an email to our insider list with some just special things just for you, just for you. If you want to get in on that, you got to join our insider list over at our website. Just go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. You will see where it says insider email list there. Join that. Just takes a moment. And I send you a ton of talks just to inspire you as well. Again, the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now your Saint of the Day. St. Columba, pray for us. Columba was born in the year 521 to Irish royalty, descendants of King Nile of the Nine Hostages. A highly educated priest and impressive preacher, he studied under St. Finian, along with 11 other future saints, altogether known as the Twelve Apostles of Ireland. In the 560s, with 12 companions in a small boat, Columba left Ireland for Scotland, possibly due to a conflict with the Irish High King. Columba and his followers settled on the island of Iona in the Inner Hebrides, where they founded a now-famous monastery with Columba as the abbot. From Iona Abbey, Columba converted the northern Picts, including their king Bruda, and founded many other monasteries throughout Scotland. Though a severe ascetic himself, Columba was ever cheerful and charitable in his demeanor. He was a prolific writer and excellent teacher. Legacies carried on by Iona Abbey, which produced numerous saints and the famous Book of Kells. He was also a famed miracle worker. On one well-known occasion, he banished a fierce aquatic beast, which had been terrorizing the Picts, back to the bottom of the river Ness. The saintly abbot also predicted his own permanent rest from his labors on the Sabbath day of Saturday, June 9th, 597, before the abbey's altar. He is venerated as one of the three patrons of Ireland, and also known as the Apostle of the Picts. St. Columba, pray for us. Did you just blame St. Columba for the reason why we never see Nessie anymore in Scotland? Hmm. Interesting, Jake. Very interesting take. And now your headline news. Just the news reports China to play secret base in Cuba to spy on the United States. According to U.S. officials with knowledge of highly classified intelligence, China reportedly reached an agreement in principle to pay several billion dollars to Cuba to allow China to create an electronic eavesdropping facility in the Caribbean island. 
The Cuba facility would allow Chinese intelligence officials to monitor U.S. ship traffic and listen to electronic communications throughout the southeastern United States. The eavesdropping facility could also try to listen to communications from the many military bases in the southeast. U.S. intelligence indicates that the base would allow China to monitor communications ranging from satellite transmissions to emails to phone calls. The Blaze reports charges dropped against man arrested after trying to, quote, Bible to pride rally attendees. A Tuesday Facebook post from the Berks County District Attorney reads, quote, After a review of the incident, which took place on June 3rd in the 800 block of Washington Street in the city of Reading, the district attorney's office has withdrawn the charges of disorderly conduct filed against Damon Atkins, close quote. According to the Lancaster Patriot, which initially covered details of the arrest, an email from Berks County Commissioner Christian Leinbach said, quote, from what I've seen thus far, I believe this was an unlawful arrest and could open the city of Reading and their police department to legal action. CNA reports Father James Jackson pleads guilty in child pornography case. Traditional Latin Mass priest Father James Jackson pleaded guilty to a federal child pornography charge Thursday and now must wait to find out how long he might spend in prison. In a plea agreement he signed ahead of his scheduled June 20 trial, Jackson, 68 years old, a priest of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, admitted to a single charge of receipt of child pornography. U.S. District Court Judge William Smith, sitting in Providence, Rhode Island, set a sentencing date of September the 11th. Prosecutors will seek the mandatory minimum of five years in prison and will move to dismiss a second count of possession of child pornography. Each charge carried a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. The priest, however, must still face pending criminal charges related to a child pornography investigation in Kansas. And those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. As Jesus was teaching in the temple area, he said... How do the scribes claim that Christ is the son of David? David himself, inspired by the Holy Ghost, said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? The great crowd heard this with delight. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The applicant would say, because Christ was coming to his passion, he corrects a false opinion of the Jews, who said that Christ was the son of David, not his Lord. But Christ shows himself to be the Lord by words of David. As if he had said, ye cannot say that David is this without the grace of the Holy Spirit, but he called himself him Lord, he called him his Lord in the Holy Ghost, and that he is Lord, he shows by this is added, till I make thine enemies thy footstool, for thy for they themselves were his enemies, whom God put under the footstool of Christ. Close quote, the afflicate. Now uh it is it is assumed here that he is speaking mostly to the Pharisees, the Lord, in making this commentary. Very fascinating. It's sort of forcing them to come to grips with the reality of the person standing right in front of them. Could you imagine Jesus standing in front of you, looking you in the eye, and then you come to realize that he is the God-man? Like, mind blown. That's pretty much what's going on here. Haydock's Catholic Bible Commentary says this, The interrogation of Jesus instructs us how to refute the adversaries of truth. For if any assert that Christ was but a simple and holy man, a mere descendant of the race of David, we will ask them, after the example of Jesus, If Christ be man only, and the son of David, how does David under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, call him Lord. The Jews were not blamed for calling him the son of David, but for denying him to be the son of God. Close quote, Venerable Bede, as quoted in Hadock's Bible commentary. Do you see? The Lord cannot just be a simple man. He can't be a good man. He can't be just a prophet. He can't be a wise man. 
He is the God man. That is the reality that has consequences that we must come to grips with. The Ignatius Catholic commentary said, Jesus affirms the divine inspiration of scripture. Although David wrote the Psalm, the Holy Spirit authored divine words of prophecy through him, declared scripture itself exposes the inadequate understanding of Israel's leaders. Although the scribes were rightly aware that the Messiah would be a royal descendant of David, they overlooked the Messiah's lordship over David in Psalm 110. This leaves them with a dangling question. How can David's son and successor also be David's superior? In Psalm 110, David foresaw the greatness of the Messiah by calling him Lord, a title associated with Israel's kings. Accordingly, David's successor becomes his superior. Once the Davidic heir is crowned and enthroned by the Lord, Jesus stakes out this royal claim for himself. Theological reflection yields another solution to this puzzle. Jesus is the son of David in his humanity, and thus David's successor, while he is also the divine son of God, and thus David's superior Lord. Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 202 and 668, close quote, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Dive deep into the scriptures. You know, I use uh, Verboom as my cheat tool. It's fantastic. Not inexpensive, but incredibly valuable. If you want great Catholic scripture study, you might check out Verboom. I'm not sponsored. I just love the tool. It's been amazing for me, and I'm sure it will be for you, too. I'll put a link in the show notes today for you. Hey, coming up after the break, Kelsey Wicks is back. Sister Wilhelmina still impacting souls. The Dueling Nuns coming up next. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network is dedicated to answering the critical need of access to quality, consistent, professional, and proven Catholic programming. We cannot rely on other media outlets to properly represent our church. Catholic Radio reaches Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, and non-believers alike. As a non-profit lay organization financially independent of your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you, praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, David Ramos from ACI Prensa is going to be our guest. We're going to be talking about religious persecution in Mexico, just south of the border. Is Mexico still a Catholic country? Did you know there were more priests murdered in Mexico than in Nigeria in recent times? That's a pretty startling realization, and David Ramos is going to help us to dive into that. But before we do that, I want to talk to Kelsey Wicks. This orga- this uh, community, the Benedictines of Mary, uh, the Queen of the Apostles out of Gower, Missouri, is just an amazing community. And to realize that their mother superior has uh, has is incorrupt after five years in the in the grave. And her body doesn't smell is an amazing reality, I think, that uh, we're just coming to grips with. And I love the fact that this is happening at a time when in California, they're honoring the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, this anti-Catholic hate group in their capital. We have someone like Sister Wilhelmina Lancaster to really give God praise for. It's the dueling nuns in many ways, and Sister Wilhelmina is so up to the task, and Kelsey Wicks joins us now to discuss that. Kelsey, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. Really enjoyed your conversation last week with Mike Koeniger, who was filling in for me while I was out of town. Uh, Thank you for being on for that. Just getting to know Sister Wilhelmina was really pretty amazing, and uh, we appreciated your insight into that. Now, what I want to talk about, though, as a follow-up, is really the impact of Sister Wilhelmina, and the reality is that she's incorrupt, on the community itself, uh, I, I think it seems to me like they really weren't expecting to have the kinds of reactions that they were having. They were just doing something fairly routine in exhuming the body of their foundress because they were going to move her. Tell us about that part. Well, Joe, this is a, a fascinating turn of events here. And I don't think that anyone could have predicted, at least of all the sisters. When I sat down to interview the abbess, 
she said, you know, when we found her body was incorrupt, I said to myself, do I Google what to do with an incorrupt body? <laughs> I mean, there really <laughs> is no protocol when these kind of things get revealed. And so, um, yeah, the shock of uh, having to absorb all of those visitors, um, 20,000 on at least 20, one day 000. over Memorial Weekend, on at least one day over Memorial Weekend, it's, it's pretty incredible. So wow. there's um, there were certainly tens of thousands of visitors throughout the time that she was um, laid uh, in the chapel and then until the time that she was enclosed in the, in the glass case and um, put to a, a more final resting place. So um, it's been a remarkable journey, I think, for the sisters and absorbing the impact of that has been has been um, not surprising for them in some ways. They did not um, deviate from their aurorium. They, after a while, they stopped greeting the guests and just continued on with their religious life as you would expect good religious to do. Am I get the sense that this is a community that wants to kind of be quiet and hidden, you know, kind of uh, not in the limelight, so I imagine that this has been somewhat of a, a difficulty for them in their community. And I'm glad to hear that they're just like, okay, well, we got to move on at some point. But the faithful are still coming. Yes, that's true. Well, they're Benedictine, so they will receive each each guest as though he were Christ himself. That hospitality is legendary in the rule of St. Benedict. Um, but after a certain point, they, they were helped by many volunteers. Um, people came and set up porta potties and directed the visitors where to go. And now that that stream has, has quieted a bit, I think that they're able to return more to their aurorium. They stopped sending the sisters out to greet people. And as you know, it's very important to um, a contemplative community like that to maintain places and times of silence and the enclosure. And that was precisely why Sister Wilhelmina founded it. So um, they have gone back to a more normal, more normal sense of, of life God. for themselves. <laughs> Has there been any response from the local bishop on this? Do we, do we know what he's thinking about all of this? So Bishop Van Johnston is involved in the case and um, certainly has been notified, has uh, said, you know, the bishop's office is definitely um, interested in, in seeing an investigation through to determine whether or not this is um, truly miraculous. And so um, he is involved. And at this point, it's it's a matter of, of science, thorough investigation, um, prayer and waiting. Now, I've heard, I've seen some reports from some of the people who have been there, I guess prior to her being put in the glass coffin, I'm supposing, that they didn't smell an odor of decay. There was no odor of decay. And some reported smelling a strong sense of of flowers, which is, I mean, Padre Pio had that. uh, He was accused of that while he he was alive, that strong sense of uh, flowers, the odor of sanctity, so to speak. Yeah. So I was there myself, Joe, and um, I did not smell any putridness, decay, decomposition. I'm I'm from a a small town in Wyoming. I've been around farm animals, um, dying animals, dead animals, and there was nothing of the smell of decomposition there. There There was no smell when I was there. Others have reported this aroma of sanctity and um, a smell like flowers, a smell um, like a garden aroma, and um, that's that's certainly been recorded in, in a few of the articles that Catholic News Agency has done. So, all right, do the, at this point, I think they're consulting, the, the, the sisters are consulting about the next steps, but what are the chances of a cause of canonization moving forward? What, what, would, you, what would you say? What do you think? We're, in a percentage-wise, what are the chances we'll see some movement here? I mean, we've got to put some numbers well, on the I, table here, Kelsey. Put your cards down. I am, down. I am not got. a Vegas person. Uh, this Come is not on, a, I don't Kelsey. know that this is a Be betting brave. game. I, Be brave. I think, that what, I think what this is is really it's down to um, two things, obviously, right? So there's mm. the examination of her life and um, and the forwarding of, of the cause for her heroic virtue, which is what sanctity is, right? It's not just boiled down to miracles. It's it's actually a, a validation that this person has lived a life of heroic virtue in conformity to Christ. So that will need to go forward after one more year because you have to be deceased at least five years in 
order to proceed with the cause of canonization. And then yeah. after that, it will come down to miracles. Now, I do know that many people, I've received reports of many people who are sick, who are ill, who are seeking certain fevers, visiting her body. The abbess um, told another media group recently that um, they were already beginning to hear reports of, of miraculous healings and that they are going to um, wait patiently to announce those after investigation. They might be involved in, in the investigation as part of the canonization process. So the, the next steps really are um, up to a review of, of sister's life and then and then up to the, the continued um, intervention of God if, if in fact this is this is him speaking to the world. So he will he will defend his own if, if he wants her to be a saint. Amen. Praise be to God. I do find it very fascinating that we see this sort of uh, duality here over over nuns, that the, the, the sisters of perpetual indulgence in, in California who have been an anti-Catholic hate group now for a while. And I'm glad to see that there's a strong pushback from the bishops. I think that's very important that they should lead the way. In fact, uh, I think there's going to be a, a good rally against them on Janu- on June 16th at the, the Dodger Stadium there. Praise be to God. And at the same time, that was beginning to become an issue and a story in the headlines. We got the story of Sister Wilhelmina and somebody with, uh, you know, seemingly great sanctity. Somebody like your conversation that you had with Mike last week. You know, you fall in love with her just listening to you talk about her, let alone, uh, you know, how her community holds her so very dear. And it does seem like a beautiful testament to her life that her community has a beauty that radiates from from uh, from the from the sisters there that I was listening and pl- I played just a piece of their music uh, they have several albums that are chart topping. You listen to their voices, and it's 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 heavenly. It's it's angelic. It's beautiful. It's divine. And I think the good, the true, and the beautiful is more of what the world needs. So, how do you see that contrast between the the hate group in California and the beauty of this community? Well, what's interesting to me is that this has become one of the, the biggest stories worldwide, and I think it, it's a testimony to the fact that holiness is ultimately much more intriguing than sin. I mean, uh, you know, I think at this point, everybody is really tired of, of the defamation, the violence, the vandalism, the blasphemy against Catholicism in, in American culture. We've seen a dramatic rise in that in the past year. And now, you know, to have a, a, a bit of good news, a bit of hope, a bit of um, a, a bit of sanctity, um, that, that aroma that people have said about her body, it, it's part of the story in, in a lot of ways about how hopeful and how and how beautiful it is and I, I think you're absolutely right that the good, good true and the beautiful is always going to speak louder than anything that's of the opposite my daughter has written to these sisters uh last year we were discerning whether or not to try to uh, have my have our daughter uh, spend some time with these with these beautiful women and so we've gotten to we got to know them a little bit before all this happened and it's it's in a beautiful thing to see, and then to have them embrace tradition in the way they do, to have them embrace the traditional hymns and the traditional Latin mass. That was something that Sister Wilhelmina that you talked about in the last interview. It was very near and dear to her heart, and I think that's a, a that's a that's one of the puzzle pieces here, right? The the depth, the richness, the fullness of the Catholic faith, the, the patrimony, the richness of liturgy of the smells and bells, of of the hymns. That is as much a charism out of this community as just their habits, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think that what we're seeing around the country is actually a dramatic increase of um, vocations, at least in, in Carmel's and other places where the traditional Latin Mass is celebrated. And, and that's maybe consonant with some of the other orders that um, are contemplative, um, experiencing increases in vocations to really well celebrated Novus Ordo masses. But listen, if you're going to dedicate your life to the praises of God, there certainly is an attraction to be able to to um, meditate upon the richness of those hymns and to sing um, to sing the, the most stately and exalted ones that you can. So I, I certainly see the uh, um, that there is borne out in the statistics of the community that that type of interest. Yeah. 
I love the fact that it's also in Missouri, centrally located, making pilgrims a, uh, a lot easier to kind of get there versus way out on this coast or way out on that coast. So uh, Sister Wilhelmina did us a big, big favor by founding that community in, in Missouri, <laughs> make, making everybody's life a lot better. Uh, then this is the facility itself is beautiful as well. I mean, they have a gorgeous church. And uh, I think that's also a testament. You know, I think that's a big part of what we need to re-embrace in architecture, in art, in culture, in liturgy, in smells and bells. It's a, it's about all of it coming together to impact souls. And I believe that was the testimony of her life. And this list, again, listening to you talk about her was, I felt, was very inspiring. Just as a little girl, her desire to want to join this community at a time in our country where, you know, there were so many difficulties for, for young African-American women. So, uh, Kelsey Wicks, thanks for inspiring us with Sister Wilhelmina's story. I have really appreciated that. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll keep, we'll keep our eyes on the story. Amen. We'll have to have you back soon. And thanks for getting up early today. Appreciate you. God bless you, Kelsey. Have a great weekend. All right. Coming up after the break, we're going to have more breaking news and stories. And then ACI Princess David Ramos is going to be our guest. Is Mexico still Catholic? I have a theory. I've shared it with you before. But if we can reconquer, reconquista Mexico for Our Lady of Guadalupe, we will take North America along with it. Praise be to God. Wouldn't that be amazing? So we need to focus on what's going on in that country because it's not good. David Ramos is going to give us all the details coming up after the break with the breaking news. All that and more of A Catholic Take is headed your way. We'll be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. CNN reports Pat Robertson, Christian televangelist and one-time presidential candidate, dies at 93. The Christian Broadcasting Network said in a news release, Pat Robertson, longtime TV host, religious broadcaster, educator, humanitarian, and one-time presidential candidate, died at his home in Virginia Beach early Thursday morning. He was 93 years old. Born in 1930, Robertson founded the Christian Broadcasting Network in 1960 and was a Southern Baptist minister a year later. He ran for the Republican nomination for president in 1988. Afterward, he founded the Christian Coalition of America, which promoted conservative Christian political candidates. LifeSite News reports U.S. Air Force graphic shows airmen saluting the rainbow pride flag. The United States Air Force is celebrating the LGBTQ Pride Month with a serviceman saluting the pride flag. The Air Force published a tweet Wednesday reading, quote, June is Pride Month. The Department of Air Force proudly recognizes and celebrates generations of LGBTQI plus service members and their con- contributions to our Air Force and Space Force, close quote. The tweet is a part of the unprecedented official U.S. military campaign to celebrate what I would call grave immorality of LGBT pride. Fox News reports Joe Biden allegedly paid $5 million by Burisma executive as part of a bribery scheme, according to an FBI document. President Joe Biden was allegedly paid $5 million by an executive of the Ukrainian natural gas firm Burisma Holdings, where his son Hunter Biden sat on the board, a confidential human source told the FBI during a June 2020 interview. The source is briefed uh, by Fox News Digital on the contents of the FBI-generated FD-1023 form, alleging a criminal bribery scheme between the then-Vice President Joe Biden and a former national that involved influence over U.S. policy decisions. That was a foreign national. An FD-1023 form is used by FBI agents to record unverified reporting from confidential human sources. The form is used to document information as told to an FBI agent, but recording that information does not validate or weigh it against other information known by the FBI. Meanwhile, according to Catholic Vote, former President Donald Trump has been indicted with at least seven federal charges relating to alleged obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and illegal retention of classified government material. He has been ordered to appear in federal court in Miami on Tuesday. The indictment has not yet been unsealed. And those are your headline news. 
Good morning to our 300 club members over on iCatholic Radio. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. iCatholic Radio, you can listen to Catholic Radio 24-7, clear as crystal. Watch the live video feed right in your app. It's right there. Just download it today in your iOS or Android app store. Get the podcast of our program and much more. Download iCatholic Radio and share it with a friend. By the way, if you would like a magnetic bumper, a bumper magnet uh, promoting iCatholic Radio, contact us at the station. We'll mail you one. Just go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT and get all of the details. Mexico is a country I pay attention to. I'm a <clears throat> devotee of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I love the fact that uh, she defeated the paganism and satanic cult of the Aztec Empire there. And she converted millions, and she wants those millions to convert the rest of us. Praise be to God, I want that to happen. But Mexico is under assault in a bad, bad way. And David Ramos, ACI Prensa, is on with us today. Good morning to you, David Ramos. Good morning, Joe, and good morning, everybody. And God bless everybody who's listening to us this morning. Yeah, praise be to God. Thank you for your time, David. Really, really appreciate having you here Mexico, I read in one of the articles, and there were several, I'm going to be linking to all of them in our show notes today uh, from the CatholicNewsAgency.com website uh, related to Mexico. I I saw a statistic that said there were more priests murdered in Mexico than in Nigeria in recent times. That startles me. I try to report on the persecution in Nigeria as frequently as I can, and it is unfortunately very frequent that we have to report those stories and yet mexico it, it may be worse it, it seems startling to me yeah uh, i think that last year just one uh, just one less than nigeria and and we should be really surprised about that because yeah we can we can look into the nigeria situation and we can find religious persecution war uh uh, Muslim guerrillas uh, fighting over there, so like Boko Haram, and we can kind of understand why there's a late motive to attack Catholic Church, Catholic priests. But when you watch Mexico, you kind of understand that it's a mostly Catholic country, so there there should not there should not be a reason to persecute the Catholic Church, persecute and kill priests, persecute and kill uh, lay Catholic people. And even as we had on on this Monday, uh, shooting over hundreds of bullets against a Catholic temple. You, wow. you shouldn't be watching that kind of stuff. And that's what we see right now in Mexico. And it's really, really worrying. So the question is, is Mexico still a Catholic country at this point? Uh, in, on the paper, we could say yes. Yeah, mostly, most, most of the people declare themselves Catholics, over 70%. Uh, it's a number that is, uh, is going down in last years. Uh, we can check about the numbers uh, in, 2000, in the year 2000, and we can find that it's almost uh, more more than 10 or 15 percent. I remember uh, of of people saying they're Catholics, and we can find that uh, it's growing the number of people who who declare themselves uh, religious but not affiliated to a to a mm-hmm. to a church, and even the Protestant, uh, the evangelical people is is growing in Mexico. So. It's 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 not that much a Catholic country as a, as it used to be uh, some years ago, uh, but it's it's on the paper. Uh, you can you can go to to any church to any to any place and you can find that every every day there's less and less practicing Catholics in this country, and it has to. It's 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 surprising because uh, Mexico has suffered a lot of persecution especially from the government and in those years are the are the years that the that the catholic people was most uh, faithful and uh, in these years that formally you can say that you can be sort of a catholic in the public sphere and there are less and less catholics practicing catholics in this country 
In your article over at CNA, you write, according to a report by the Multimedia Catholic Center between 1990 and 2022, 63 priests were murdered in Mexico, including the Archbishop Guadalajara, uh, who was gunned down in broad daylight in the parking lot of the International Airport in 1993. But just recently, an Augustinian priest, Father Javier Garcia Villafaña, was shot to death in his car. I mean, this is... This is this is crazy. This is Mexico. I, I think most Americans, when they think of Mexico, I mean, they realize that there is corruption in the government. They realize there's cartel problems there, but they don't think in this terms of persecution against the church. And yet in um, and there are states in Mexico that the cartels own them. They run them. The government has almost no control over those states. And these are armed thugs and they see priests as a key to destabilize those communities and take control and power. So if they take out the priest, they get control. Isn't that the case? Yeah, exactly the case. Well, in, in those in those little towns, in those towns that the authorities uh, don't get because they can or they they don't want to, uh, the the prominent figure is the Catholic priest. The prominent figure is the Catholic Church. So. If the when the narco kills a priest, they're saying we can kill whoever we want. We don't we don't have to to respond to any authority here. We can do whatever we want, and we won't pay a price. We recently uh, remember 30 years of the of the murder of Cardinal Posadas, 30 years, and we still don't know who killed him, why killed him. Uh, there's there's nobody in jail for that crime. Uh, authorities doesn't care about that crime mm-hmm. anymore. So if 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 the narco could kill a cardinal and go through 30 years and not have any kind of sanction, they're saying clearly we we don't have to to pay respect to nobody. We own this country, and that is the message. When you kill a priest, is we own this land. Nobody could tell us what to do, and you should be aware that we could kill you too. Your life doesn't mm-hmm. worth anything because the life of the priest, the main figure of the community, we don't, we don't care about that one. So we won't care about you. You know, there's so many complex layers to this story. So the narcos, the, the cartels, they also have embraced Santa Muerte as a part of their religious cult, which I think is intentional in order to to attack the church, to attack the true faith, to be a mockery to Our Lady and the saints in particular, and uh, trying to drive the heart of the people away from the truth and into a lie. Uh, and and I think that's very important for us to, to talk about because at the end of the day, uh, we can be thinking about solutions, how to fix this, maybe a military intervention. Maybe the United States should take its military down there or give we give billions of dollars to Ukraine why couldn't we give billions of dollars to Mexico, you know, to to combat the cartels? But at the end of the day, this is a spiritual combat, not a physical one. How do you think the church will overcome this? How are they going to win back the hearts of the laity in Mexico who seem to have forgotten who they are? Well, the church is working on these on these uh, mission of peace. They are they are they are working on on promoting peace, I think that <clears throat> that re- regaining these hearts uh, for J- for Jesus will will really, uh, as, as you say, this is a spiritual battle. This is this is a uh, narco people, criminal people, uh, corrupted in their hearts, in their souls by evil. So, yeah, this is a this is a war that that just that just Jesus can can win. And as long as the church remains faithful to evangelize, uh, to to talk about God, talk about grace, talk about uh, the danger of sin, of mortal sin, I, I really think that this will this will lead us to 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 this solution. Uh, but it. it it's, it's true also that uh, Catholic bishops have tried of looking for 
these alternatives with the government, uh, Archbishop of Morelia, Monsignor Carlos Garcia, said to us some, some weeks ago that it's sad that when they try to, to work with the government for, for peace solutions for these towns, these plans just get on the, on the desk. This, 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 these plans doesn't get heard, uh, and, and it, it, it all goes to nothing. So that's, that's the sad part. The church is not just working through evangelization, but it's working through the civil authorities to get some, some peace works. Um, they just don't want to, to listen to the church. That's mm. the hard truth. And yeah, the, the, the policy, the bishops have criticized this policy of hugs and no balls, abrazos, no balazos of this government is paying this price. You you can see the the you can watch videos online that you can you can see uh, the the Guardia Nacional the National Guard and the army uh, is looking through passing through the 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 narco squads and they do nothing. Wow. Maybe because they are afraid. Maybe whatever reason they just don't don't do nothing. And the people feels this. Not uh, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Archbishop Durango was uh, an attempt on his life was made by an 80 year old. But we're up against a hard break here. We're going to come back. David Ramos is our guest. ACI Prensa, Catholic News Agency dot com. We're going to be linking to these stories in our show notes. But what did it all start? Was it the Plutarco Caius laws that started all this? Did it go back even further? We're going to have that conversation and more with David Ramos. But so goes Mexico, so goes North America. Our Lady of Guadalupe must crush the head of Satan yet again. And we're praying for that. More to come. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. The after show is coming up at the top of the hour where we say goodbye to the radio. We hang out on the live video stream for another half hour, hanging out with you. You get to drive the conversation. And sometimes those conversations can uh, get very fun, interesting, and and, uh, rabbit holes are all enjoyed. But you drive that. You can go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. You can find the live video link there, places to comment there as well. The, we have the insider email list that you should join immediately, the podcast, and so much more, the show notes. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. We're having a conversation with David Ramos with ACI Prinza, Catholic News Agency, and uh, we're talking about what's happening in Mexico, religious persecution. And I say, well, so goes Mexico, so goes North America. Our Lady of Guadalupe did something amazing there in the 16th century. She sent a very fallible, you know, man who has was definitely not perfect. Hernan Cortez, along with his conquistadors, went there and they utterly destroyed Satan. Personally, I'm telling you, it's an amazing story. I've been reading the actual accounts, not the historical revisionism that's taught in your high schools and your colleges, but the actual stuff. It's amazing to see what Our Lady, what Our Lord had in mind for the people of Mexico, for the rest of us. And yet now we're seeing a time and an age where their hearts are going back to paganism and it's time for a reconquista of Mexico and watch how that will benefit the rest of us in a big way. David, welcome back to the show. I'm playing a little clip here from the trailer of For Greater Glory because it, one, it was such a good film. I enjoyed it personally. But number two, I wonder, did Mexico's troubles start under the Caius regime, under the Plutarco Caius laws, the anti-clerical laws, or do we have to go back further in time than just the Cristeros War? Oh, we we should we should go back uh, before the Cristero War because the Cristero War started because uh, the Constitution of 19, 1917, some years before the the proper religious perse- persecution that that Mexico lived in the first half of the of the 20th century, uh, and we probably should go even uh, to the mid uh, mid 19th century uh, because 
those, those were the years that that saw the rise of the reforma laws that were the first attempt to take away properties and rights from the Catholic Church, saying that, well, the Catholic Church shouldn't own these lands, Catholic Church shouldn't own these buildings, Catholic Church should have that that presence level in the in the public sphere. So that's where it started. But it wasn't that clear because Mexico leaves some kind of, of status quo in in what uh, the people uh, didn't realize how how much uh, how much danger uh, the 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 public living of the faith uh, was going through. So yeah, it it probably it begins around that time in, in mid in nineteenth century when when it all began. <clears throat> Some. Mm. With, I'm sorry, with Benito Juárez. Uh, mm. Then you can find Constitution of 1917 and then the Cristero War under uh, Plutarco Elias Calles regime. What's interesting about the results of the Cristero War was it, it brought some relief to the Catholic faithful in Mexico, but they still had these restrictions and they were around for decades. They weren't like priests wearing clerics in public, for instance, that was not allowed up until, what, 20 years ago, maybe? I mean, it just seems strange to me that Mexico, the faithful, would still tolerate that. I mean, I think they proved to Mexican government and to the world that they're willing to fight and die, and to the point where they would be even successful holding back the Mexican army. Uh, you would think that they would say, stand up for their rights, for their religious liberty, for their their freedom to worship uh, God in the proper way and and uh, embrace their Catholic faith and not not allow these rules to kind of persist. But yet they did. They they went along with them. And I think that led to the culture we have today where priests have shrunk into the background somewhat. And as a result, the corruption, the cartels, the uh, the agnosticism of the lay faithful has all led to a situation where we could see the light of Mexico go out. What say you, David Ramos? Yeah, I think that one of the one of the sad thing of the of the after of the Cristero War is that the the Mexican state uh, got away with uh, people thinking and believing in the absolute separation of church and state. Yeah. And whatever sounds a little religious, it, it has to be really, really a way of the, of the public sphere, of the political sphere. So if a priest sounds that is speaking about something that has to, to, to do with, with politics, it's, it's, it must be silence because the separation of church and state, the state has led to believe every Catholic people that it, we're talking about Mexican that they believe they are Catholics. They believe they are faithful Catholics. So most, more than 70% thinks that they are faithful Catholics. But at the same time, they think that the priest shouldn't speak about politics or what mm -hmm. they, what they right. think it's politics, like abortion, like gay marriage. And they think that if a governor or if a or if uh, any uh, any public authority says that they are, I don't know, they're praying to God for this, okay, that's a violation against the separation of church and state. So people have been educated like this for over 80 years. So mm. they are led to believe this way. And that is what, uh, what has, has led uh, Mexico this way. Because people have been indoctrinated in this way for, for, for years and years. At the same time, they have prohibited that religion, uh, Catholic religion being taught in schools, in, in public and private, and since 1992, just in public schools. And yes, you were saying about the uh, prohibition of wearing clerical clothes for priests. And yes, this, is, this has been so prohibited that even Pope John Paul II, when he came for the first time in Mexico, was fined because wearing clerical clothes because he was wow. he was wearing the Pope clothes. Wow! So yeah, that's that's what the way, and and we have to remember that in those years Mexico really was 
more Catholic than it is today. And even so, the authorities mm. got away with fining the Pope John Paul II uh, because mm. we're in clerical courts. So, yeah, yeah this Anna is... Morales, Anna Morales, in her article, she says, for the, for the year 2000, according to INEGI, Catholics represented 89.7% of the population. 20 years later... The percentage decreased to 77.7%, while an increase in Protestant Christians and people without religion was noted. She also talks about in this article that the attacks are against Catholic churches in that country. So the, like you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, bullet holes and all that, they're not on the mosques, they're on the Catholic churches, number one. Number two, marriages are declining and failing in Mexico. Mexico is looking more like the, you know, the rest of us in the West than a Catholic country. Uh, we're going to run out of time here soon, but these numbers don't paint a very good picture. Do we have any hope of seeing this turn around in Mexico? Well, I, every every time I talk about this with, with the priests, with the bishops, yeah, we have the Christian hope. We have the hope that that Jesus is going to is going to win this 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 war, this physical and spiritual war uh, in Mexico and in the world world. But yeah, when when you see the the facts, the 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 data right now, it's it's a sad panorama. Yeah, it's a sad panorama. But but we know we know that Christ will triumph. Christ will triumph. Let's pray for the souls. That will ignore him and deny him in the meantime. David Ramos, God bless you, my friend. I really enjoy having you on our program and getting your insight into these stories. Thank you for that. Have a great day and have a great weekend, David. All right, that's going to do it. We're going to put links to all of these uh, articles and discussions we've had today in our show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Today's the day I send out the insider email list. I've got goodies. I'm sending it your way. Jump on the list. Go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT.